Hello and welcome to PFF Fantasy Football Podcast. I'm your host, Ian Harditz, and let me just say happy week one, everybody. It's been a long seven months since our last NFL action. I think I speak for all of us when I say I cannot wait for Thursday night football and this weekend in general. So make sure you check out Tuesday's episode for a breakdown of all 16 games. But today, we're going to focus more on fantasy decision-making. I brought on a very special guest to accomplish this goal, PFF's resident projection master and data scientist, all-around smart dude and host of the new PFF Unexpected Points podcast, Kevin Cole. Kevin, how's it going, man? It's going well. That may be too kind of an intro. Um, I'm just out here plugging in numbers and seeing what comes up. Basically, it's right. You want to think that it's, you know, a data scientist, whatever that means. It's such a nebulous term anyway. But when it comes to projections, man, there's a lot of sweat and grind into it because you can't just data science your way to knowing whether or not Miles Sanders is going to get X share and now he'll be the lead back. I mean, it's so, so, so much of projections. It's not as scientific, I guess, as people are trying to say what projections are projections have tons of assumptions built built into them so you know don't just go on a site and think okay now i'm getting a projection so therefore i'm getting some sort of scientific answer you're just getting a set of assumptions basically 100 man hey don't, don't be too modest you're doing a big job out there right. and we all appreciate it so all right look we're gonna start off the episode with some start sick questions that were sent to our twitter handle at pff underscore fancy could be doing this every week i'm gonna pull you know at least 10 or so from that so you got a tough question be sure to send it in next week after the question oh after these kevin and i will give us some of our favorite DraftKings picks of the week. So let's get to it. Quarterback. This is from at BZ233. Cam Newton or Tom Brady? Kevin, who you got? I am going to take Tom Brady, although I will say it's close. I mean, the problem is I, I, problem is just the uncertainty factor around Cam Newton. I mean, I had a discussion um, on, on my podcast with JJ Zach recent about Cam and he he's picking Cam as one of these high upside guys for season long. I agree with that. The the question is going to be whether or not he's going to run the ball. Basically, that's that's where he that's where his bread is buttered. That's where he's going to put the fantasy points on the board. And I guess I'm just a little bit skeptical what may end up happening in week one against the Miami Dolphins in a game. Maybe they think they can win without him having to take those sort of risks. So that's why I would be a little bit concerned on that. And our projections, at least, and a lot of our, our forecasts are, are really pumping up Tom Brady this year, primarily because he's getting this such a massive upgrade in the receiving core. Yeah, no, I, I kind of scoffed when you said that, but at the same time, I have Cam at 10 and Brady at 11, so I'm hardly uh, off the <laughs> mark here. But, you know, I do think that Cam, he's healthy, he's there. I'm going to treat the guy as a top 10 quarterback until proven wrong. Rushing, uh, rushing volume, definitely a concern. But, man, looking at this Saints defense against Brady, especially if Mike Evans is banged up now, I mean, the Buccaneers, to me, were this defense all offseason that I kind of knew they were underrated and were better than most people thought. But the Saints, man, after I look more and more at their roster, I mean, adding Malcolm Jenkins and Janoris Jenkins, that could really help bring those secondary up to a really, really high spot. And, you know, low-key, I think, last year when they lost Mark and Marcus Davenport uh, down the stretch, man, that really hurt their pass rush the rest of the year. Do you think there's a chance in this NFC South kind of moving forward we don't see the same sort of shootouts week after week? You know, I was thinking about the same exact thing because people are pretty high on the Tampa Bay defense also, right? So typically you would say you're in the dome, it's a Saints, the Saints are playing, you know, the massive scoring. I guess we have to, you know, take a hint somewhat from from what we're going to see as far as uh, the total on this and you know, they're still they're still throwing up a pretty decent number there. So I I, I think I'm going to go with that. But you're right that it's something that's concerning me. Brady's been someone who's played with a lot of pace. I think that that um, Breeze can do that also. So hopefully that'll make up for the fact that this could be more of a of a slugfest on the defensive side of the ball than people think. Yeah, I do like the under, but once I'm going to be betting that, then watching Breeze and Brady go up and down the field might not be feeling quite so hot. All right, next one this is from at Lobster506. Tyrod Taylor versus Matt Stafford. Who you got? I'm going to take Taylor here, although it's, it, again, it's one of these close ones. But I think I'm more confident that Taylor will be picking up some, some, uh, some, some work on the ground. He's going to give that floor. Uh, you never know what's going to happen with the with the Bears defense. They were largely turnover dependent a couple of years ago, but they still have pretty solid fundamentals. So I think, uh, you know, going into the season, we could find out the defenses have flipped upside down after a week or two. But I think a safe assumption going into it, despite the fact that he was at home, Stafford was making a lot of plays on some pretty high variance, longer passes this year. Maybe that won't happen. I'm going to take a little bit of a safer route with Taylor. 
Yeah, I'm right there with you. I mean, Tyrod, QB7 in fantasy points per game in 2015 and 2016. Get used to playing t- the artist for- formerly known as Ty God, everyone. I mean, look at this early season schedule. The Bengals, Chiefs, Panthers, Bucks, Saints, Jets, Dolphins, Jaguars, Raiders. That's all before the Week 10 buy. I know not every single one of those is cakes. We just talked up the Buccaneers and Saints defenses. But truly, that rushing upside is a cheat code in fantasy football land. All right, six-point touchdown league. This is from at the extra point FF. Kyler Murray versus Matt Ryan. You know, I'm going to lean towards Matt Ryan. And I know this, this might be a little bit com- controversial f- for some, but I'm buying a little bit more the difficulties that Murray may have with the 49ers defense, even though I know he acquitted himself fairly well this year. And just generally, I'm going to be more conservative on Murray this year because we're all expecting that leap. We've almost priced that into everything about him, whether it's his season-long price, whether it's what he's going in, in DFS. And I just don't think we can be certain of that yet, at least, um, despite the upgrade in the, in the receiving core with um, DeAndre Hopkins coming there so for for that reason it's mostly the fact that I'm I'm a little bit conservative on Murray right now yeah honestly I was higher on Kyler before I've seen some of the developments just so everyone knows we were taping this on a Wednesday at uh, 4 30 p.m eastern and you know some of the stuff out of the 49ers today Fred Warner got activated off the COVID list Nick Bosa was pretty like easy going about this you know muscle strain he's been dealing with so I was looking at it first wondering okay no Bosa no Warner Buckner's and Indy maybe you know uh, the uh, Cardinals can take advantage of this softer defense but yeah, it's rough. I still might have Kyler a little high. And, man, the Falcons, I, they're one injury away to a lot of positions from being in serious trouble. But, hey, right now they're not injured. And Matt Schaub threw for, what, 460 yards or something against his Seahawks defense last season. I think I'm underrating the Falcons' pass game volume just a little bit. And, yes, I do think we're crowning Kyler a little bit early just in terms of some of the things he might do in 2020. Moving on to the running back position. This is from at Football Miles. Melvin Gordon versus Cam Akers. I'm going to go with Gordon here. Again, I'm fading the uncertainty that we have with Akers. Um, I know people love him as a rookie. I do think he's in a great situation as someone who can come out on top, and we'll know that in a week or two. Gordon's an, an interesting play, though. Uh, Philip Lindsay is, is obviously his primary competition. I like Lindsay a lot, too, but at least Gordon has shown that he can really be that type of workhorse running back. And for some reason, they want to turn him into that. I I think he has a decent floor because he's going to be involved, at least in some way, in the passing game. So I'm going to lean Gordon there. Yeah, it is close. I think Akers could be uh, close to auto stars early as week two. I, mean, I have him as the RB22 this week, and you know, that, that kind of seems a little bit ambitious. But Gordon, RB19, I do think in this scenario, you got to take Gordon. But a lot of other, you know, uh, qu- potential running back questions, I think we would be on the Akers train. But, you know, w- would hardly be shark- shocking if Malcolm Brown ends up playing 60% snaps for this first week. All right, this is from at Best Ball B Rob. J.K. Dobbins versus Zach Moss. This must be a pretty deep league, but it's a, it's a decent question. Yeah, I'm going to go Moss here only because I think it's been explicit coach. The, the coach speak, you never really know, but I think it, it aligns with what we know about the split between between he and Singletary this year is to say, you know, he's looking like a guy who's going to get some goal line work. He's looking like someone who may be a, you know, let, let, let's rotate series as opposed to he's someone who will just be used on early downs and not get kind of valuable reception work. So I think because of that, I like that a little bit more. And I think the the death of Mark Ingram has probably been a little bit overstated, at least in week one. So again, it's one of the situations where I, I'm generally fading some of these rookies in week one who are running backs. But for Moss, they're so explicit about his role and I really believe that should be his role, that I'm buying him a little bit more this week. And that was the concern, I think, when they drafted Moss. It was like, okay, this guy's definitely getting the Frank Gore early down work that's left over, and he could eat into the pass down work, and that appears to be what happened. And, yeah, I'm not buying the Ingram departure, and I don't even know if Gus Edwards is going to be fully uh, cycled out, man. I mean, this dude has been one of the most efficient running backs in the league, back-to-back seasons with over five yards per carry. I fully think Dobbins is better, but it's just hard in week one in a matchup they don't need to assume that they're going to, you know, just immediately bench some of these incumbent players that have done some good things for them. Same thing we're seeing, you know, Marlon Mack and Indy. So just just something to keep in mind with these backfields. You know, is a two two back backfield, three back backfield. Right now Buffalo is firmly in the two RB situation. All right. From at TH Wilkes, Sony Michelle or Boston Scott? 
I mean, I'm going to have to assume this was being asked uh, when there was maybe a little bit more uncertainty <laughs> with what was going on in the Patriots backfield. I mean, I don't think it's really a question. You still got to go. You got to go with Sony Michelle here, if only because uh, the way things have played out for, for week one in particular with Damian Harris, there is just whether we like it or not, it, it, there's going to be volume there for Michelle in a game where they should be leading. Um, they should be leading early. Uh, there's going to be the type of work for for his skill set, so I'm going to go with him. I mean, there's an out, you know, there's an outside chance of what we see with Miles Sanders, and we're hearing now that his his uh, workload is could be limited this, these first couple of weeks, but could be limited isn't enough for me to turn it over to someone like like Boston Scott this year. And I also think there's an outside chance that Corey Clement could be a little bit more involved than some people are projecting in that backfield. Yeah, that's why I, I kind of wanted you to take more on Boston Scott than anything. I thought the same thing, man. Like, all, all the training camp reports about Clement is that he is as healthy as ever, and he's doing good things. I mean, he was a major weapon for them uh, in the in the passing game in that 2017 Super Bowl uh, run they had. And, you know, you look at why Boston Scott had these big games down the stretch run last year, and it was either Sanders getting hurt early in the game or their just wide receivers were so barren. Who else were they going to throw to? They are pretty banged up right now. But, yeah, I think you got to take the 15-plus carries versus the Dolphins, you know, in this scenario so moving on wide receiver we got at joel smitherman five ty hilton versus dk metcalf yeah this one is really tough for me because dk is one of my favorite breakout candidates this year so i think purely for that reason i'm gonna pick dk although if you're looking for the most likely outcome i think ty hilton is probably going to edge him out and i also think philip rivers another guy whose death has been overstated a little bit too much theory i think he's going to bring some life to that offense but I, I, i'm going for let's get on the breakout train on week one with dk metcalf man i would be so much more on hilton and rivers maybe i'm overthinking it but i just don't know how this jaguars front seven is even going to come close to slowing down this run game and we even kind of saw it last That's year when the, we even kind of saw it last year when the chargers played the jaguars i mean rivers threw for 314 yards and three touchdowns and only 22 attempts i mean i think that was the game where eckler took that you know short screen like 80 yards to the house okay it wasn't you know consistent downfield passing or whatever either way i mean that's just absurd efficiency i agree his decline is probably being overstated a little bit but I do wonder about just how much volume they're going to have in that passing game we can say the same thing about the Seahawks uh passing game but you know Falcons Seahawks it does look like one of those potential shootouts and we'll definitely want Metcalf if that comes to fruition I am with you on Metcalf there okay from at M Morg 14 you know taking the recent news and over the last 24 hours into account DJ Chark versus OBJ yeah, I don't know. I'm not going to take, I'm going <laughs> to plead the fifth on any, any, any of that stuff. But, you know, I've been a lot higher on Beckham this year than, than a lot of people. I just think the distribution of targets in that offense, you know, despite the fact that, that Beckham didn't perform well last year, it really was pretty thin as far as how much they were spreading the ball out. Obviously, they're going to be using tight ends a lot more. They're not going to be using a third wide receiver. Um, we'll see how the backfield ends up playing out as far as how the distribution of targets there. But I just think it's possible for, for Beckham to still get the, that lion's share of targets. And last year, he was just off as far as his connection with Mayfield. So if they can make that up this year, if the new system can bring in some, let's say, you know, Stefan Diggs, ish type of productivity it's probably not getting to that level but if you can get close to that level with the volume i just think that beckham has a lot of upside this year so i'm going to take beckham over Chark, who, who i like who was a great breakout last year but there's i think there's just more questions on that offense what's going to end up happening yeah, OBJ, Mike Evans, league high, 27 incompletions charged to their quarterback last season. I really like the Chark matchup and everything, but I'm just getting these uh, Ravens, Dolphins, 2019 week one vibes when I look at this Jaguars Colts game. And yeah, like at the end of the day, we don't want players on just God awful offenses projected not to do all that much. So, you know, I, I remain kind of optimistic season long with what Minshew and Chark can do. And I think I would even take Chark over OBJ in this tough matchup, but you know, that's the only guy on the Jaguars I want. You know, I see everyone out there wondering James, Rob, uh, James Robinson, Davina Zigbo, Raquel Armstead. The answer is no, everyone do not touch that back. Backfield, backfield, please. Um, all right, from at WH Terrell, Terry McLaurin versus Will Fuller. It's interesting because Fuller has been one of my favorites this offseason, but so has McLaurin. It's just a situation where if I'm projecting targets week one, it's hard not to get a lot of volume from McLaurin. And I know there might be concerns about Haskins and the efficiency there, but I just feel like he was so good last year 
um, with, with the volume that he had. It's almost a guarantee that he's going to see that volume again this year. Whereas for, for Will Fuller, you know, he's been a guy that's been used a lot, but he also has a whole new mix of guys around him. Now, if Brandon Cooks is not playing, then I could see that bumping him maybe right in line with McLaurin. But um, as I see it now, I'm going to take Terry McLaurin. I'm going to take the volume. I'm going to take the potential breakout there over Will Fuller, even though I love Will Fuller. Yeah, I would hope uh, Mr. Terrell here has a pretty deep bench or deep starting lineup, whatever it is, because the fact you got to pick between these two is unfortunate. I am going McLaurin. He's my wide receiver 11 this week. I got Fuller at 19. Look, McLaurin, he faced his shadow coverage from Darius Slay last year, and he got held to 70 yards. But you watch the tape and, you know, hashtag watch the tape, and there are actually two overthrown touchdowns in there where McLaurin definitely had more than a step on Slay. It's going to be a good matchup. I mean, Slay is going to make life hard for just about anyone, and you know, it'll be fun to see him with a better pass pass rush that the Eagles can provide compared to what he was kind of dealing with with the Lions last year. But yeah, Fuller should be the undisputed one in Houston and demand a bunch of targets or maybe Deshaun Watson just spreads the ball out more than ever. There's a little bit of unknown there as high as Fuller's weekly ceiling is. Give me McLaurin F-150 targets. All right. Tight end from Mr. Porras. Great handle. Johnny Smith versus Blake Jarwin. Uh, I'm going Janu on this one. Uh, again, I don't think it's a huge difference between those two. In some ways, you could say with with Jarwin, you don't know what's going to happen, so maybe there's some upside there. But I'm I'm buying C.D. Lamb really soaking in a lot of those targets that are that are missing from the year before with the departure of Cobb, uh, with Jason Witten being gone there. So I think I think those are going to flow more to him than they are going to flow to Jarwin. And I don't think Jarwin's going to get up in the necessarily up in the 80 something target, 90 something target range. Um, whereas I see CD Lamb being a guy who could threaten a hundred targets this year. So because of that, I'm a little bit down on him this year and I'm going to go with, with Smith. Yeah, Cobb and Witten at 83 targets last year. Cowboys only behind the Falcons in available targets, but yeah, it would make way more sense if the wide receivers get the lion's share of, of those available opportunities. Man, so I was on Jarwin. You're almost kind of convincing me, though, to go at Jonu because their projection should, their projected targets shouldn't be all that different. And at first, I want to say, give me the five targets and the Cowboys offense over the Titans offense, but I mean, give me five targets to Johnny Smith. That guy's just an objectively better football player, I think, than Blake Jarwin. Truly one of the beastliest tight ends in the league. So, all right, Kevin, you, you win that round. I'll, uh, I'll change mine to Johnny Smith. I like that. Flex call at Rory McLean, 17, Kareem Hunt versus Marvin Jones. Yeah, you know, I guess it depends a little bit on – uh, what what scoring system that you're going here if you're going PPR or not but generally I'm I think I'm going to lean towards Marvin Jones here I think it's a it's a pass offense again that's a little bit more narrow um, we really you know you never really know on a week-to-week basis whether or not it's going to be Jones or it's going to be Galladay is going to be the featured guy there and for Kareem Hunt I guess I'm a little bit lower than some people are on him this year one of the primary reasons is he was used in conjunction with Um, Nick Chubb a lot about 80% of his snaps last year Nick Chubb was still on the field and when Kevin Stefanski was was in Minnesota he he really used um, Madison and Dalvin Cook separately he did not use them together on the field at the same time he used a fullback a lot in the in in that 21 personnel so I'm just interested interested to see what they're going to end up doing in Cleveland whether it's going to be taking a series here versus taking a series there between those running backs and if that ends up being the case there might be a little bit less for Hunt if Chubb starts going than people may think whereas you know Marvin Jones is going to be on the field you know he's going to be running a route every single time so I'm going to go with Jones here. Yeah, I'm with you. PPR wide receiver 14 with Stafford under center last season. I think as long as he's healthy here early in the year, I mean, you'd be hard-pressed to find uh, too many guys in that wide receiver two range that you should be starting ahead of Marvin. It's interesting with Hunt because, you know, I do think he is more like a more viable, like him and Chubb, I think their skill sets are different enough to warrant getting them on the field at the same time, you know, compared to Cook and Madison who can maybe, you know, are, are doing similar things. Only Tariq Cohen and Kareem Hunt had a snap rate above 30% uh, last season in the slot or out wide will that persist with Stefanski it's a good question I'm kind of in the wait and see mode with Hunt as well I mean you know with that contract obviously he's going to have a major role in the offense but to me it seems like a situation that could actually swing further back towards Chubb and he's the guy that can flirt with you know 300 carries when it's all said and done all right last one from Valentino called 11 Hollywood Brown versus Jonathan Taylor we'll say half point PPR yeah, I mean, I'm going to go Brown here, and I, I don't think it's particularly close, at least um, 
you know, viewing it for week one. I know I sound like a broken record on, on a lot of this stuff, but when we have, you know, Marlon Mack, who the, the team trusts, when we have Naheem Hines and you have Jonathan Taylor there, I think Taylor is a perfect example of a guy that's going to get going and, it, and could dominate and could win leagues in the second half of the season. I just have trouble seeing him go, go out there and be that, that dominant back up front. And then Marquise Brown on the other side, I mean, he's definitely a breakout candidate. I know sometimes you can be folly to compare players, but when you align him, not only as a prospect coming out of, of college, but what he did in his rookie season, you know, he just looks like a Deshaun Jackson 2.0. And if he can continue to play, if he can continue to get that target share for, from Lamar Jackson, I think there's a lot that he can do this year. So I'm going to take him. And I, I, and again, for this one, I don't think it's particularly close, at least for this decision week one. Yeah, Hollywood and DJX both looking awfully chalky on DraftKings with those uh, low prices in the 5Ks. And I, I think it's warranted. I think uh, Hollywood should be kind of have that Will Fuller, even DJX to some extent, uh, position where, okay, if he's healthy and in a decent enough matchup, I mean, try to get him in your lineup. And, you know, these boomer bust wide receivers almost got like a negative connotation sometimes. But, you know, there's a lot of receivers out there that can't boom the way that we know Hollywood Brown can. You know, six weeks as a top 32 wide receiver last season, six outside the top 64. But, you know, I think playing without a screw in his foot could go a long ways towards uh, evening out that efficiency once again the undisputed number one wide receiver in that Baltimore offense I am absolutely with you all right so those were the start sits again make sure you uh, look at at pff underscore fantasy next week want to submit your questions that would be fantastic we're gonna move on to some of our top dfs plays Focusing on DraftKings pricing, uh, we're going to go through some cash and GPP plays. Not going to, you know, go through each uh, with all the positions, but Kevin and I will specify that in our explanation. So, Kevin, hit me with your quarterback you want to talk about and, you know, prepare to get angry, all you listeners out there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is definitely going to fall into the, the GPP category. And, you know, you, you got to live sometimes. You got to live. Um, maybe it's not living with glory, but it's but it's it's at least seat of the pants. And that is uh, Mitchell Trubisky is is my choice here. And the reason is um, obviously his pricing is a little bit lower, but you're not you're not getting such amazing um, uh, price discount here as as you might think at around fifty four hundred. But you know, versus the top options, yes. But the the real reason that I like him is I think that people are not going to be in love with him. He has a good matchup when we're talking about playing playing at the Lions there's potential there and I think everyone is really fading his rushing ability this is a year where we see people moving Cam Newton up boards we see people relatively high about someone like Tyrod Taylor we see people putting Josh Allen in their top five quarterbacks all because of this this rushing uh benefit and then we look at Trubisky and I think everyone thinks what we saw with that with his down rushing stats the first half of last season is exactly who he is but you know, in the second half of the season, he started to pick it up a bit. Down the last six of the ga- last six games of last year, he was averaging almost five and a half attempts per game. He got in the end zone a couple of times. So I think that's the one element of his game I really think that he needs to do in order to be a successful quarterback this year. And it's something that people may be discounting in his ability to put up points in week one. Yeah, I think the 2019 season is just so fresh in everyone's minds that they're kind of forgetting that in 2018, it was almost like a Daniel Jones S season and that he had like three or four just really big splash weeks. I know there were a couple of Millie Maker winners that had Trubisky and uh, as their quarterback, there was even a Bears fan that rostered nobody except Chicago Bears and came away with a million dollars. Good for him. So yeah, man, I, I see it. Trubisky has thrown three touchdowns against this Lions defense in three straight games against them. He, I think what happened with his rushing ability, it really correlated with when he suffered that shoulder injury uh, to, to, in the second half of the 2018 season. Really didn't see him lean on the rushing ability the rest of that that year and then last year really it took until the Cowboys game to see them do any sort of uh you know major practice with them there so hopefully they get back into it because you know why not play to your guys strengths and at Trubisky's point I mean you, you just might as well give him the opportunity to do that I'm going to go with another guy with the rushing floor we mentioned a little before but Tyrod Taylor at 5600 I think he actually is in play on cash I wouldn't worry about it too much in GPPs I don't know if the sky high upside is there but look Pass game weapons are spectacular. I mean, you can dig into it. And I even like stacking with Keenan Allen a little bit. Bengals allowed league high marks and yards per attempt to uh, slot receivers last season. This was the league's worst defense in uh, rushing yards per game allowed to QBs. I know that's a lot because you're playing Lamar Jackson twice a year, but even the other guys, Kyler Gardner, Josh Allen, they all had good games too. And just a pretty bad defense overall. So again, we talked about Tyrod earlier, QB seven fantasy points per game, 2015 and 2016. He was their backup last season. I feel like he's familiar with the offense. 
I'm riding the Tyrod train early. Kevin, where do you have Tyrod like kind of like how are you approaching him this week? Because am I just too optimistic on it and everyone's been afraid to call me out when I'm talking about him? Because I feel like he's got this early season start. We should be attacking it. Yeah, you know, I think I, I'm trying to look at the at my rankings here. I mean, I think I have him around, I mean, a little bit lower than you. I mean, you have him at 12 and then I have him at 15, but I would say that that's, it's not, you know, a, a big leap, uh, yeah. a difference there. And I just think people... You know, the, the Bengals are going to are gonna be – it's going to be some rough sledding, I think, early for them. So uh, Tyrod should be able to play with some positive game scripts. He should be able to pick up some, some yards on the ground. And I just think there's a, there's a higher ceiling – I mean, a higher floor with him than a lot of people are suspecting. So I agree that he's a solid play. And I have him, you know, right in the, right in the middle of the pack where conceivably there are a lot of great plays this week. All right, running back. Who is it and why Todd Gurley? Well, yeah, so, so Todd Gurley, again, this is one of these situations where I know that I've talked about fading uncertainty a lot, but when it comes to Gurley, if you're going to play him any week, I think this is, is a good week to play him because not only does he have you know, the injury concerns, which may limit his workload, and I think that could come into play a little bit more down the season, but you know, just look at the backfield here. I mean, we are talking about a backfield that is, that's him, Brian Hill, and, and Ido Smith. I know that those guys have shown the ability to carry some more volume, but not particularly effectively. And in this type of game, you know, the Seahawks secondary has gotten a lot better. They're probably one of the better secondaries, um, at least in the, in the NFC. And this is going to be a game where I think they're going to look to see whether they can, whether they can use Gurley on the ground a bit. And where he's end up being priced right now, uh, I mean, he's at 6,100, where he isn't cheap. But if you look at the options below him, there's no one who's really going to be someone that you can think is going to carry, is going to be a bell cow type of guy going forward. It's mostly your committee backs or maybe your more satellite options that are, that are below him or some guys who may have some questions as far as their role or their injury status. So I think for that, you're getting a guy who should have the workload at probably the, the, the lowest price you're going to find someone in that, of, of, with that type of role. Definitely a solid pivot off of expected chalky Miles Sanders. It's it's been a concern to me just how big will the workload be. Maybe I'm wrong on this. I just you know, he could push for 15, 20 rush attempts. And if they really like his target volume, I guess he could get it. It might not be pretty. I don't think he's going to score, you know, 13 rushing touchdowns again. But in this week one spot, you said it, the front seven with Seattle is looking awfully weak, as good as their secondary might be now. This would be the spot that you want to fire up Gurley. So, yeah, GPPs, if he's going to have that depressed ownership and a bad kind of outlook going in, sign me up. So I'm going to look at another running back in that range, a little more expensive, but it's Mr. Kenyon Drake sitting there at 6,400. Look, this is one potentially one of five or six backfields in the entire league that I think features one running back. That's the way it was last season, whether it's David Johnson, Chase Edmonds for a week, or Kenyon Drake in the second half. Whoever that guy was, they were eating up the snaps, eating up the targets, eating up all the rush attempts. And again, you know, I, we'll, we'll see if the projected ownership kind of changes with Sanders. But if he's going to be chalky in that Washington matchup, like I don't even know if it's that much better of a matchup. Don't look now, but that Washington D-line is full of monsters after having all these, you know, high first round draft picks and getting some of these studs over the years. So, you know, we talked before about how the 49ers defense actually is getting in a better place and maybe they looked a couple of days ago. But, you know, Cardinals, they still had some decent success against the 49ers, particularly on the ground. They scored 25 and 26 points I just think you know people might still be a little too conditioned looking at that 49ers defense and just thinking stay away but you know as many questions as we might have about Kyler Murray and the Cardinals passing game still this run game is already amazing yeah, I mean, if you you told me before before we came out that you had Drake as your pick and he would have been one of my guys I just feel like there are a little too I guess people are a little too skeptical about of Drake and what is what his workload will end up being. So we'll, we'll end up seeing what happens. Yes, yes, we will. All right, wide receiver, who you got? Yeah, you know, you've kind of shamed me a little bit by talking about how <laughs> Jackson is such a chalk play this year, and he was the one, uh, he was the guy that that I picked there. I mean, obviously he's only forty nine hundred. There's you know walking. There's nobody there. Um, in the receiving core, he's someone who had maybe it's a little bit too perfect that he had such a blow up game uh, the year before with a couple of long touchdowns and nine targets against this exact opponent. But I just feel like at least in cash, he's someone that you, you almost have to schedule in there in order to maximize your, your uh, median outcome. 
I guess that's like the part about DJX this week to harp on. See, he's always a pretty good GPP play, but he truly is viable in cash. Assuming Rager isn't going to play, I mean, are you concerned after hearing that Rager pretty much went through practice and was apparently fine? Uh, no, I mean, it would be, it would be a surprise to me if he, if he ended up playing, I mean, anything could end up happening, but I think even if he did end up playing, I wouldn't necessarily, uh, be completely off of, of Jackson, but yeah, that would definitely hurt. So we'll, we'll, you know, you obviously got something you got to monitor as we get up to game time. If anything, it might help if that just depresses the ownership. Cause I mean, who even knows if he's going to be able to play full snaps and D Jackson, right. if he's the number two receiver out there, he can have a big day. So I like the call in cash. I'm looking at Stefan Diggs and GPPs at 6,400. I think this is going under the radar. We got a potential top five, probably top 10 talent at the wide receiver position facing a miserable secondary. I mean, I think we might be, you know, we I've talked about the Jaguars and Panthers maybe being the league's worst two defense, but the Jets are right there with them after losing Jamal Adams, having CJ Mosley opt out and just not really adding anyone of note to their cornerback room. I mean, it was, I believe it's our PFS number 32 ranked uh, cornerback room going into the season and they deserve to be that. So we got Josh Allen, who, you know, as everyone out there likes to say, PFF just hates him. That's not true. He's so entertaining. Chill out. But Josh Allen, what was his biggest issue last year? It's throwing deep and they just got PFS number one receiver and deep receiving yards last season try to fix that problem i know it might not be efficient you know it, it might be a few overthrown targets here or there but i mean stefan Diggs is going to have huge games this year Smokey brown was a ppr wide receiver 20 in 2019 i think we'd all agree as much as we all love john brown stefan Diggs, superior talent i think he can go off and i don't see why it won't be week one kevin you with me man yeah, I mean, I'm not against you, I guess. <laughs> I don't know if I'm with you. I'm over on the side. I'm over on this. I'm, okay, I'm like on, this, on the side of you. So I'm not fine. Of course, you know, I, I like to poke fun at Josh Allen. We, we all do. And it'll be interesting to, to, to see what ends up happening. Because, yeah, the, the targets that we saw last year, I don't know if Diggs is going to help necessarily. I think you'd need like uh, – like plastic man or something hey, maybe, hey. Maybe, maybe maybe to bring in some of those targets so I, i'd be i'm more interested on props on uh, how long we're going to go before we get the first um stefan diggs subtweet of josh allen that's what i want to know is, is it is it before week two or not we'll see that is a good question we'll see if uh all right serious question josh allen let's put the over under four and a half weeks you think he clears 300 passing yards before uh october I mean, no, I, I'm, I'm just looking at history, here, you know, uh, if you want to say someone's entire life, I mean, maybe in Juco, I don't know. I don't have a Juco numbers in front of me, so it's possible in Juco. He, he did. He did clear that. <laughs> so, he cleared so it in the Bills scrimmage, man. He got the monkey off okay. his back. He got in a scrimmage. So, so I'm, I'm going to say no. I'm still not judging him on NFL uh, quarterback standards. I'm still judging him on Josh Allen standards. You got like an 0 for 28 stat working in your favor, and I am still offended by it. All right, moving on to tight end. Who you got? Yeah, I mean, this is not it's not a deep it's not a deep dive play, but I'm talking about uh, Mark Andrews here, and the reason is I think this year, I mean, this week, especially if we're talking about what's going to be chalky, I mean, people are going to love George Kittle, and they're going to try to find some way to fit him into their lineups uh, because they're facing Arizona because of the, the wide receivers that are missing there. Now, right below him in, the, in, in, in projections for us, um, not too far below him, we have Mark Andrews, but he's significantly cheaper at 6,000. 6, I think Andrews this year has a legitimate shot of either ending up you know, first or second overall. So displacing one of either Kittle or, or Kelsey this year just because – that was, you know, no one targeted tight ends more than Lamar Jackson uh, last year. It was 40, over 40% of his targets went to the position. If you look at the depth chart this year, it's Andrews, it's Boyle, and then it's no one at, at legit tight end this year. Hayden Hurst is gone. You know, he didn't take up a ton of targets, but still that's, you know, like in nine, 10% target share that's, that's there to be had. I just feel like he's a player who can take it to the next level this year. So he's someone I'm willing to bet on week one, being that a few weeks into the season, we're going to look back and he's going to be right up there as potential TE1. And then everyone's going to say, oh yeah, you know, he's a guy you have to, you have to look at and His price is going to be right there with someone like Kittle. So I'm going to try to take advantage of that discount uh, week one. 
He more or less is a wide receiver. I believe it was 66% of his snaps last year. He was in the slot or out wide. And, yeah, I mean, even though Lamar Jackson, we talked about how his passing touchdown rate's going to regress going, to, going into this season. But, like, his passing attempts are going to go up. And Mark Andrews is his number one receiver. So we can actually, you know, think about, hey, what would Mark Andrews look like with 120 targets potentially? Like, that could happen. And a player of his caliber, number two last season, only behind Kittle in yards per out run. Scary aspect, man. He can put up some numbers this year. I like that. I'm going cheaper. Uh, you know, I people at home maybe thought I could get through an entire podcast without mentioning his name, but nope. Chris Herndon, 3,300. Need this guy. If you want to save some money, I think he is the go-to cheap tight end. You can cash him, GPP, whatever. I mean, the injury report, I haven't seen the Jets' final one yet, but I know going into the week, I mean, almost every single guy there, with the exception of maybe Chris Hogan, was banged up. Even without the injuries, I think Herndon's the Jets' number two uh, receiver just in the offense. He's uh, moving positional designation from the matter. We've already had Gase come out and say he's the starter, talented guy. I mean, the only concern is we got, you know, just this ugly game between the Jets and the Bills probably gonna be slow paced you know low scoring we don't like Sam Darn we don't like Adam Gase but I feel like they can do enough to get Herndon or maybe Jamison Crowder it's it's disgusting either way you want to look at it but I think one of these guys can produce are you touching anyone in this uh on the Jets side of the ball in this one Kevin yeah I mean I, I've liked Crowder in season long I'm a little bit more skeptical for this matchup I mean like you mentioned uh, the tight end position traditionally is just so touchdown dependent in order to put up uh, those big scores that it makes it a little bit tougher here. So, I mean, I have to ask you, um, if you, you know, you like Herndon. So when, when Gase says something positive about him, do you have to not like him then? Like, isn't that how it works? The Gase factor is like the opposite, oh, no. right? Like I know coach speak is normally a positive or is it just purely, you're just purely confirmation bias. So no matter who says it, you like him. So that's what I'm, that's what I'm wondering here because uh, that sounds like a jinx. Like if Gase says literally anything else, in the entire world, everyone would fade it, except for this. Everyone seems to be in on. Oh, my gosh. This is the moment I'm going to look back on next Monday as I'm <laughs> sobbing, checking the Jets-Bills box score. Oh, my goodness. We'll see. I think he's going to be out there and do his thing, no matter what Mr. Adam Gase has to say about it. But, all right, everyone, that's going to do it. Kevin, thank you again, man. Everyone follow Kevin on Twitter, at Kevin Cole, PFF. What do you got on the pipeline for us this week, man? Well, you know, I do a lot of showdown stuff. So there's a, there's content out there on showdown, not only for Thursday night, but for Sunday and Monday night. I think this, this, this game, obviously tomorrow and tomorrow night, everyone's going to be going to be waiting for it. It's finally the season's kicking off. So that's really what I'm going to be focusing on. I also have some other simulations that I do for DFS, looking for ceilings and different stacks that can come into play. Um, so I'll just look for all that stuff. It's really a lot of idea generation type of type of uh, uh, ways of looking at the slate that people may not be doing in traditionally. Awesome, man. We'll make sure everyone at home checks that out. And also the Unexpected Points PFF podcast with Kevin. Great stuff as always there. Thank you all for listening. I'm Ian Hartis. This has been the PFF Fantasy Football Podcast. And until next time, take care, everyone. Thanks for watching the PFF YouTube channel. And if you want to subscribe, all you have to do is push the button. Don't forget everything you get. A little fantasy, push the button. A little green line for the gambling aspects of the game, push the button. College football, push the button. The YouTube channel from PFF.